So, um, hi David, thanks for joining me. So, I'm um, very happy to be with uh, Lord Young, David Young, who uh, I've been fortunate enough to be friends with for a number of years. And uh, David is a very youthful 88, you may not see him it, but he, um, but he certainly uh, has a lifetime of achievement behind him in entrepreneurship, in, in the charitable sector, but also most well best known for his time serving with his stature. Um, I believe you were one of Mrs. Thatcher's longest serving cabinet ministers, and you were certainly one of her closest, uh, most trusted advisors. So we'll, we'll come to the Thatcher um, section of your life in a few minutes, but tell me first of all, we're in the middle of the coronavirus lockdown. How has it been for you? Well, we're in our ninth week now of living in our house in the country. Um, just my wife, myself, and, and a housekeeper and in our 64 years of married life we have never spent as much time uh, as we have over the last nine weeks and we're still married so at least some things there we are there we are your wife's been waiting for this moment for 64 years <laughs> to have you at home and not not working all the time so yeah. uh, she's no it's a it's a pleasant thing it's a pleasant side effect maybe to it is. I thoroughly enjoyed it anyway, but Good. it's a terrible time, but still. Of course, of course. So tell me, David, let, let's go back to the beginning for a moment. What, where, tell me, you know, what about your family or where you were born? So. Well, we're, in, my father were, was an immigrant. Um, my mother as well were, were daughters of immigrants. My father was born in a village called Jurovich, 20 kilometers from Minsk. And he lived there with his parents and grandparents and two siblings in two rooms. And uh, um, they, uh, my life would have been quite different, I presume, but they were driven out by pogroms. And they came to this country, United Kingdom, in 1905, when my father was five. I, I, I just want to say... Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask, just remind people who they may not know about pogroms. What, why they had to leave? Yes, from the period of 1880 onwards in Russia, Imperial Russia, the Tsar presumably had been in trouble, but he was. There were always, from time to time, they they bring up riots against the Jews who lived there, and there were a couple of million Jews living there, and this was far worse in a way than the Holocaust, because people you knew as neighbours and lived with all your life came along one day and killed you. Uh, and to give you an idea, um, and this is an exceptional story, but Ilya Salita, who runs the Genesis Group of Charitable Funds, uh, told me that his grandmother was the youngest girl of a family of 12 daughters. Just imagine, that's the triumph of hope over experience, yeah. to have 12 girls. But anyway, and one day, being the younger, she went to a neighbor to play with for the afternoon who wasn't Jewish. And whilst they were away, there was a pogrom, and the parents and all 11 sisters were killed that afternoon. And this girl was disguised as non-Jewish for a few years, and a few years later managed to reunite with other members of her family. But it, it's something which people tend to forget about now. Well, anyway, my father came here with his parents. Now, I was going to say the Holocaust was so overwhelming. The pogroms were in a way genocidal, but because the Holocaust was so enormous, people, you know, today they seem to think anti-Semitism just started with the Holocaust. But of course, it was a long, in fact, mo many Jews, my family too, were driven, many Jews in the West, in, in Britain, America, Canada, were indeed driven from Russia, Ukraine, Poland, and so on in that period. Anyway, so your you are you your father came to Britain and you were born in. Um, obviously, he didn't um, speak the language. In fact, there's a lovely. I have a diary of his elder sister, who was amazed that when they came to London, they could speak the language. Well, the reason was they landed in the pool of London at the port, next to the East End. And uh, the language in the East End was Yiddish, so mm -hmm. they understood the language. But they found out later that English was slightly yeah. more popular than Yiddish. Now, your your father 
he had you had one brother who I unfortunately died of, of cancer but your you, both you and your brother Stuart is just remarkable um, isn't it I mean what well it, it, it if you think of it my, my father as I said came here when he was five um, quickly uh, uh, became a small businessman he brought up my parents we were very fortunate I had one brother and before dad passed away um, I was in the cabinet and my brother Stuart was chairman of the BBC now that's a big jump in one generation it, it is a big jump in anybody's family yeah. ever and I mean these are I, if I can put it like this although I have my gripes with the BBC and along with the government these are maybe with the royal family but you can't quite get into that so easily the government and the BBC are the ultimate British institutions and you and your your one sibling were you know I don't want to say running the government but you were playing a role in that case, let's say. well it, it, yes I, 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 there is a reason and the reason was that my father was a very remarkable man both my parents were actually and but he said to me and to my brother the whole way you here, you live here, you have got to give back. And he made sure that what Stuart and I did when we were young and we carried on, uh, that we spent a large part of our time on voluntary bodies. And um, I, I must have spent a good third of my working hours always working for Jewish charities or charities in the wider community. And of course, um, I, I spent many years in government. So let's just talk about the government for a bit. We have, look, I remember as a, as a child and, uh, and so on, or an early teenager, the, the um, terrible period right before Mrs. Thatcher's government came to power in 1979. There was a so-called winter of discontent. There was, I and mean, I was only a kid, but I remember the strikes. I remember the rubbish not being collected and, you know, being very, and, and the feeling of British demise. And, I, for one, I know there was a lot of criticism, criticism of Thatcher, but I, for one, could see immediately this is an outstanding person, quite different from other political leaders, almost revolutionary. So my question is, yes, how do you, how do you become involved? I mean, uh, you, you had to live as, uh, I, I was in business already, I'd uh, really sold out one, one company and I was working. The decade of the 70s started <clears throat> with a three-day week. We had so many strikes that there could only be power for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and businesses were allocated the three days they were allowed to be open. Well, when we got over that, we came to the time that we ran out of money, and 75-6, the IMF came to London to tell us how we can spend money. This was under... Labour governments, which were essentially trade union dominated, and then it all came to a head at the end of the uh, of, of the end of the seventies, uh, when we had this winter of discontent, and every public service union went on strike, and literally bodies were not buried, rubbish was not cleared, schools and hospitals were hardly open, um, and it was so bad that the British did something nobody could have imagined. They elected a woman as Prime Minister. Now, David, you were not an MP, so it's not, you weren't kind of, um, you know, angling for a job or so on. You were brought, Mrs. Thatcher spotted you, and, or, or you came to her attention. I'll, I'll and tell the you the She brought you in, and in fact, she, she sent you to the House of Lords in order for you to join the cabinet, as I understand it, yeah. and which was quite a very unusual thing to do. So how did you come to her attention? Well, back in the late 70s, I got friendly with Sir Keith Joseph. Keith Joseph was um, a guru of the Conservative Party, one of the most respected figures, and the one person who would talk about enterprise. And that attracted me to him. And I worked on the Centre of, I was a director of the Centre for Policy Studies, which was his think tank. And I agreed in the middle of the winter discontent that assuming the Conservatives won the election, I would give up my business and take a two year holiday and help him originally with privatisation. I'd never met Margaret Thatcher at that time, incidentally. 
So we, they won the election and I went into the Department of Industry um, and one day because the department found out I'd been an entrepreneur and there weren't many in those days, they came to speak to me about the small firm side of the department and evidently for 20 consecutive years there have been more closures than startups and the number of firms had, had reduced down to under three quarters of a million. And I then got infused with this and started the first of the small firms employment schemes, helping small firms to survive. And at that time, <clears throat> unemployment started to rear its head, particularly youth unemployment. And um, because I had worked in the 70s in a Jewish vocational international charity called uh, ORT, World ORT Union, um, they, 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 ministers knew how I was interested in that subject and I was asked to become chairman of the Manpower Services Commission. Now imagine a country that allows 400,000 16 year olds to go on the unemployment register on the 1st of September in every year. I mean, just and after they graduate school, just after they've done their 16, when they're 16. But yeah. When they're 16, yes. As soon as they leave school, they go straight to the unemployment register. Anyway, I became chairman of the Manpower Services Commission. We set up programs that got them all with employers. That went on for two years. She became, I met her, we came quite close. She asked me to come into cabinet, so I had to join the House of Lords. So um, instead of being one of the politicians I always used to laugh at, I suddenly found I was one of those people, people used to laugh at me instead. Anyway, we, we carried on throughout the whole of the, the uh, 80s. And at the end of that period, unemployment had been brought down to containable periods. Nearly all, if not all, the nationalized industries uh, had been returned to the private sector. And uh, we'd had the beginnings of a real increase in an entrepreneurial society. We laid the foundations for it. You know, eventually I, I said to Prime Minister in, in uh, August 70, uh, 89, I said, Prime Minister, I've got a Jewish wife. I must go back to work. And I'd been 10 years at, at uh, you must spend some time at home. And I went back and became chairman of Cable and Wireless and other things. Yeah. You know, David, a lot of young people today have never actually lived under socialism or anything like socialism. And of course, capitalism, capitalism is not perfect. Of course, there are lots of problems and it, it should and could and tries to improve. But I think people don't quite realise, either because they didn't experience the 1970s in Britain, or they haven't, unlike me, spent quite a lot of time in Eastern Europe. And I, even as a teenager, as a young teenager, went with my grandmother on three different trips, one to East Berlin, one to, and one to Prague, sorry, two trips to my grandmother, East Berlin and Prague. They also went as a 14 year old on a school trip to the Soviet Union. That combined with, um, with uh, the memories of the late 70s. And I'm just a bit worried. Look, we're speaking on Zoom. Do people think that without entrepreneurship and enterprise, things like Zoom would be created, let alone free? So we, it's very fragile. I mean, how do you see it today? Do you think well, people take for granted startups and entrepreneurship? But I'm a bit worried, especially with the coronavirus economic uh, consequences of a return to some kind of socialism, even without people realizing that it's not a good idea, at least in my view. Well, in first of all, it's a terrible idea because the state can't run anything. In fact, we, we've just seen this coronavirus thing, how the state didn't really deal properly with protection, personal protection equipment and things. But I would be reassured. Um, when I left school, I was, 14, I, I was 16, and one of my classmates said to me, David, when you go for your interview, find out if they've got a pension scheme. Pension scheme? This is at 16. Yeah. And the, the prospect that young people had in those days was leaving school, going to work for an employer, working for that self-same employer all their life, and then retiring. Well, what a boring, stultifying life that really is. Mm -hmm. 
pay if you speak to young people and they leave. They want to work for themselves for a few years. They'll go and work with an employer for a few years. They'll even take time off and go, go around the world. Uh, and you saw in the election, which we held a few months ago, how Jeremy Corbyn, with a highly socialistic program, was completely thrown out by the British people. Not by, oddly enough, by young people as well as old people. So the attractions of nationalizing the railways so they run on time is such utter, yeah. so wrong because oh. no train ran on time in the old days. You know what, I think the people have good sense. I suspect I spend too much time with journalists and academics yeah. who live in their own little bubble and I forget that most people, as, all, all, as George Orwell famously said to somebody once, you must be an intellectual, only an intellectual could say something so stupid. So it's, um, you know, the, 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 the people have more sense often than the intellectuals. Now, I mustn't forget that although Thatcher was the most important governmental period, David Cameron also invited you in uh, for really the whole, well, for five years, I think you were his enterprise. Yeah. In Street. I, I um, didn't think I knew David Cameron. I was 78 and a few weeks before the election I suddenly get an invitation to, to go and see him and I realized when I was Secretary of State of Trade and Industry I used to do something which nobody does in government but I used to do it in the private sector. I would get all the ministers and, and whips in my department in for a three-line whip mandatory lunch every Thursday and we'd sit around the table and there were quite amusing lunches but we'd communicate. Well the chap at the far end of the table but way below the salt I didn't know was David Cameron so 20 years later 21 years later he, he, asked me to come him. he hadn't forgotten you made that impression that's <laughs> well, I think he was probably short of finding people of no, my generation no. anyway I doubt it. He could spot a, he didn't want to let a good talent go to waste. Um, listen, when you were at Mrs. Look, the society is quite different now, and Boris Johnson's cabinet is fairly multi ethnic. They're people, you know, you have a, um, both a Home Secretary and a Chancellor, who I believe are both Hindu or anyway, they're, they're of Indian origin. But in the Mrs. Thatcher's day, Britain was a bit less multicultural, and yet she did something quite unusual. She had, I think, uh, five different cabinet ministers who were Jewish, including yourself. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't that she was choosing anyone because they're Jewish, she was just, but what she wasn't doing is going with, at the time, traditional conservative, maybe a little bit of anti-Semitism, even among some conservatives, and, and there was that famous quip by Lord Denning, I don't remember if, if he's actually conservative, but anyway, Lord Denning said something like, we have to address the balance between old Etonians and old Estonians, which was clearly a reference to Jews who did not go to Eton. Um, so, uh, <laughs> look, it's, it's more than that. The London I grew up was unicultural. They were only white people, only white people from a similar background. Yes. There, was a, there were a quarter of a million Jews in, in London or in the whole of the United Kingdom. I never spoke face to face to an Afro-Caribbean until I was an article clerk 18 years old. I'd never seen one. I mean, they came in with the Windrush, which was back in 47, 48, the first few hundred. And over the years, London has become totally multi-ethnic. Um, I, when I was, we referred to my time at number 10, well, I would go in there, often the traffic is so bad, I'd go in by the underground, it's only three stops, uh, and I'd be there, and some mornings I would be the only English face, white face, in the whole carriage. And London is so much richer, and the restaurants are so much better, life is so much better, but it has changed beyond any, any, anyone's comprehension. And today, you see now, you, you see we, we, we had a, a, a Muslim, a Muslim or Pakistani Chancellor of the Exchequer followed by an Indian 
uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, we have it, we are really colorblind for the you first think, time. You think there's something about being an immigrant or the first generation born to immigrants that will be the case for many Jews of your generation, but also now the case for Priti Patel, and I, I don't know uh, everyone's individual story, but certainly the, the previous chancellor was the son of Pakistani-born bus driver. That's so right, yes. Some about immigration, would it be, is, it, is it being carried on specifically for Jews from your community? But well, also, is it in general, does it help to be in it? Does it give you a drive somehow? It does, it does. I mean, when we, when we grew up, you know, my, my parents, by the time we came along, were the old English tradition, lower middle class people. Um, and my mother would always say to Stuart and I, study, study. If you don't study, you won't have seven and sixpence for a hawker's license. Well, you know, whatever it was, my generation worked hard. Um, and many of us prospered in, in all different fields, academia, medicine, e law, everything. I look at my children, bless them, and my grandchildren. My grandchildren talk to me about work-life balance, and I really have to get the dictionary out to find out what they're, they're really talking about. But society's changed, the pressures are less. But there is something, this is nothing to do with being Jewish. There is something to being children of immigrants. There's a very successful venture capital fund in the United States that will only lend money to first generation immigrants. And, you know, so there must be something yeah, in there. Something. Although maybe just specifically on, on Jewish immigrants, not just to Britain, but many places, I mean, it, the, the achievements have been remarkable. Um, is there some reason why, why should that be, do you think? Well, I, I don't know. There, the, ever since the, the Enlightenment in 1840, when the Jews were first allowed out, out of the ghetto, I think because they spent a thousand or more years studying, because the Jewish religion was very inward-looking in those days, um, that when they came out, they had the advantage of being descended from generations of people who could read and write and intellectually argue, but they did remarkably well in, in all sorts of different fields. I, I think now, I, I, I think it is just something that lasts for one or two generations, no more. We're, we're coming back to being quite ordinary. But, but I think Jews, are, in spite of anti, I mean, there's both a rise in anti-Semitism, but there's also, I mean, uh, Mrs. Um, Theresa May put the uh, Hanukkah menorah in the Downing Street window. I mean, that's new, isn't it? Well, and, you know. If I go back to the 70s, uh, and I was quite a successful uh, business person by then, you never, ever saw anybody in the city of London wearing a yarmulke. You never ever saw anybody lighting the Hanukkah lights. Well, over the years that has changed so much. And now every year I have to go and be at the assembly of lighting the lights at the Speaker's House of the Commons, the Speaker's House of the Lords, number 10, all over government. And, and it's not because, because Diwali, we celebrate all the religions in the same way. And David, just to, just to finish off, um, a, a light question. Ha, let's look at the leadership of Britain and the United States today under Boris Johnson and Donald Trump. And first of all, do you think we're in good hands? And secondly, um, maybe you'll just share with us a little bit more about, I think Mrs. Thatcher was, you know, and a, a once in a generation or even once in a two or three generation leader. What qualities did Margaret Thatcher have? You worked with her really day to day for, for years, close up. And, and like I said, you were one of her closest uh, confidants. Yeah. So well, she was a shopkeeper's daughter. Trump, yeah, and about Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. yeah, she was a shopkeeper's daughter. She grew up in a house where over the dinner table every night, I've no doubt they discuss business and how things were going. And she had a set of principles, which she kept to all her days and did a level best to keep to in government. And you always knew where you were with her. Uh, I, I knew instinctively, 
that what we had to do is people should not live on benefit unless they really couldn't afford to and it was the duty of government to get them off it so that they can stand on their own two feet that families were important that children the parents should take responsibility for their for their children the fundamental really obligations that really make our society work and um I'm afraid when I went back later on with David Cameron, I never knew what David wanted. I could put something to him and it was a 50-50 chance whether he'd accept it or change his mind. Because, and, and she was very much, Theresa May, was very much the same. There was no guiding principles behind them. And therefore, they would do one thing one day, something else the next day, and of course, that means the government lacks leadership. Now, we have, when Trump first got elected, um, I, I was very keen. I thought, here is somebody who will not mess around, will do things. And because he'd been a businessman rather than a career politician. Yes, yes. Because, because he, well, there is a book I read a long time ago that he only stood for election because his ratings on his television program were, were stacking and he hoped he could lift it up and he promised his wife he'd never be elected. Anyway, he was elected. But the way I've seen him behave over the last few months, over the coronavirus uh, period, has been so appalling that, that I, I just didn't think any system that brought through mm. people like JFK or people, people like like all the presidents we've had, um, to have someone like that. Boris is not like that. Boris is very different. Boris is the one person in today's public life who has the gift of leadership, who could actually enthuse people and get them going. Uh, I think he's been a lot worse, more ill perhaps than people realise yeah. since he's back. He's, he's been relatively low key. But he has in himself the ability to encourage people to get them going. So I'm moderately optimistic about our position. Great. Okay, yeah. David. Well, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, and I hope you have another, I hope the coronavirus lockdown doesn't continue for too much longer, but I, I hope you have a comfortable time in the meantime. And, and uh, I understand. I a great grandfather, so I hope we're able to see your your great grandchildren and your and your grandchildren. I, I do on Zoom, but I don't many other places. But I tell you one thing: I'm quite happy to continue. But when the weather breaks, then you're going to find one rebellious individual here. Okay. Well, keep up the good work. Maybe Boris will Boris will call upon you to get Britain moving again. Working it how desperate he is, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank yeah. you. All right. Have a good oh, take care. Okay, bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.